Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this special um, webinar um, in partnership with ACAS and uh, Aaron uh, and Partners Solicitors. Um, this is a special uh, webinar that we, or support session, I suppose, that we've um, uh, arranged today specifically for the hospitality uh, sector uh, and the nighttime economy, I guess, and hospitality and leisure industry more generally. Goodness, um, of all the sectors in Greater Manchester that have suffered through COVID uh, and will continue to suffer, it, it appears um, it is the hospitality sector. And so we were extremely pleased that ACAST approached us initially and said we would really like to run a session uh, to support um, employers in that sector. So I'm delighted to be joined this afternoon by Helen Robinson from ACAST. Helen is a senior trainer and um, uh, uh, advisor at ACAS. Um, if you haven't touched the ACAS resources, goodness, go find them after this event because they are um, tremendous and uh, in breadth and depth. Um, and I know that uh, ACAS are there to help. Um, I'm also really pleased to have, um, I, I guess, an old friend of the charter now, Adam. Um, Adam uh, has been uh, supporting us uh, through his previous uh, uh, partners, um, but now with uh, Aaron and Partners uh, Solicitors. And Adam's uh, an employment law partner uh, at the practice and um, has been supporting the, the Good Employment Charter all the way through and uh, really pleased to have um, a legal view um, on the discussion this afternoon. So the format is fairly simple. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Helen and Adam and they are going to uh, present for about half an hour, 40 minutes, I understand. And then we'll have the opportunity for questions. Um, just some technical stuff before we get started. Um, we're using a, a platform called Livestorm. Um, Livestorm works best on uh, Google Chrome. If you're trying to um, view this webinar on another platform and you've got problems, maybe uh, try and uh, use Google Chrome instead and uh, hopefully things should be fine for you. On the right hand side, you will see a chat function as well as a questions uh, function. So if you'd like to um, uh, have a chat amongst yourselves, by all means, use the chat function. Um, but any questions that you have for Helen and Adam, please pop them in the, uh, the questions tab and we'll get to those at the end. So without further ado, um, Helen, Adam, over to you. Thanks very much. Thanks, Ian. Um, just, just following on a little bit from, from what Ian said and before we get on with the content of the session, I just really wanted to introduce ACAS as an organisation, the organisation that I work for, um, just in case people aren't familiar with us if you've never come across us before. Um, some of you may have done, some of you may have used our services previously, um, but just in case you're not familiar with us, ultimately ACAS is an organisation that specialises in, in workplace uh, disputes, workplace problems, workplace advice. Um, and ultimately, the, the one thing that I would say is that we really, really are here wherever possible to offer support. We do that in a number of different ways, and I'll, I'll run through some of those at the end. We've got some um, functions at the end that you can contact um, within ACAS if you are looking for further support. Um, the unique thing about us at ACAS is that we are completely impartial. So we're not here to be on anybody's side. We're not here to tell people what to do or what not to do. We're really, really here just to, to help people make informed decisions by advising them on what the law says, what best practice looks like, what options they've got. And hopefully as we go through the session today, uh, we'll be able to, to help you with some of those things specifically for focus on hospitality. Okay. Thanks, Helen. Thank you very much for that. And I just second that as well. We work a lot with ACAS and there's some fantastic resources on their website. And it's always the first port of call to check. Um, there's a lot of standard letters, documents on there. So it is really, really helpful. Um, so just by background, I'm a partner in specialising in employment um, in a full commercial law firm called Aaron Partners, uh, offices in Manchester, Shrewsbury and Chester. But today is really about trying to give you sort of a bit of a red flag and indicators as to how we can sort of try and help, um, how hopefully we can resolve any myths and, and queries that you have and sort of move forward from it. So. Um, How do we get to the 
Oh, there we go. That's it. There we go. On to the first slide. Um, I'm going to try and go through this relatively quickly because I think everybody's a bit furloughed out. Um, but I think it might, what we think it might be do is useful is to give you a bit of a whistle stop tour where we are at because we haven't gone, the, the, indica the indication was we were expecting furlough to be removed, but we haven't gone back to what it was previously. We've gone back to what it was back in August. So I want to just lay out very, very quickly where we're at. Um, <clears throat> so the furlough scheme or the coronavirus job retention scheme has been extended to the 31st of March 2021. It's halted the job support scheme that was planning to come into place. So first and foremost, who is eligible? Um, you're entitled for any claims after the 1st of November 2020. Um, all employers can claim for any employee that were on POYE payroll as of the 1 minute to 12 on the 30th of October 2020. Okay. There is no maximum number of employees that an employer can claim for. It applies to all POI employees, so that includes part-time, agency workers and zero hours workers. Employers do not need to, employees do not have to be furloughed before. Previously, there was a requirement that you had to be furloughed for a three-week period. This is no longer the case, okay? You're entitled to also furlough company directors, okay? They can perform some of their statutory duties so long that it's no more than necessary. So an example of that is issuing statutory accounts, okay? And that won't result in them deemed to be working for the purposes of furlough. But I'd advise you to look into that before you do so. There's a few technical points on it, just double check it. Flexible furlough will still be in place, it is continuing. You must keep records of the hours that the employees on flexible furlough were working, and the advice is to keep that for up to five years. Okay. Um, if you have an employee that's working 40% of the time and is furloughed for 60% of the time, um, the cap on the amount that can be claimed on the furlough is £2,500. So it, you would take up 40% um, of that and can claim 60% of that furlough point. That's how it really works in simple terms. How much can an employee claim or how much can be claimed? You can claim 80% of the employee's usual salary. So this is again going back to August 2020 for hours not worked up to a maximum of £2,500 per month. OK. Salary can include overtime and compulsory commission. It doesn't include conditional payments or performance payments. So, for example, a bonus based on manufacturing a certain number of things or a bonus, uh, a bonus based on working a certain number of hours or attendance rate, okay? You still need to apply the employee's NI and employee's pension contributions. So that is a cost that you must need to factor into the decision making on whether a furlough is, is appropriate. And what we're going to try and do is consider other options that if furlough isn't appropriate, what other options do you have? Um, employers still need to pay the employee for any hours worked as well. Um, it's going to be reviewed at the end of January. This is scheme at the moment, it's 80% up to the 31st of January there is expectation it's going to be reviewed and may be brought down again. Um, <clears throat> you can top up to 100% if you so wish to do so, but the 20% would be your liability. What if an employer was made redundant before November? If the employer was on payroll on the 23rd of September 2020, um, has since stopped working, was made redundant, they can be re-employed or furloughed but they must have a RTI submission between the 20th of March and the 23rd of September. There's no obligation to bring employees back. This was a big issue on the first set of furloughs when it was a bit unclear. We had a lot of people saying, why are you not bringing me back and get quite an aggressive approach to it. Essentially, you don't have an obligation to do so. You might wish to do so, but again, think about the economic consequences and your cash flow for your business, okay? Um, what happens if redundancy has already been paid? I'd suggest to take advice from ACAS or a lawyer on this specifically because it's quite complicated, but you can ask for them to repay it. The payment of the redundancy breaks continuity of employment, um, but if you do get them to repay it, their continuity of employment would be restored and you may have to restart redundancy processes at that stage. So just again, think about all the connotations of this when you're assessing what you're going to do. Um, if you don't get it repaid, then I'd ask you to have a think about well, why that is and, and 
there isn't a lot of clarity on this, but an area of concern is the whole purpose of the scheme is it states in the guidance is designed to help employees whose operation has been severely affected by coronas to retain their employees. I'd have a concern about it potentially being abuse of the process if you didn't ask it to be repaid because the indication is that you don't intend to keep them. So again, I'd, I'd just be careful around that. Um, need to have attained written agreement. So you need a written agreement in place and that's really, really important. It's got to be consistent with the law. Keep the records for up to five years and you need to keep the records of what's been worked and what's been claimed. Um, there's no written response required, but I would advise you to get something in writing to confirm that they've agreed to those terms. Um, it's good practice. And um, if no agreement was in place at the beginning of November, okay, because it had expired or you'd removed it in anticipation of the changes, then you had a, an opportunity to go back up to the 13th of November without agreement in place to claim furlough. If there wasn't an agreement in place as of the 13th of November, then you've lost the, potentially lost the opportunity to claim furlough because it, previously there was a lot, of a lot of situation where people were running to get agreements in place and there wasn't any clarity on it. But the new guidance stipulates that it must be in place up to the 13th of November to claim back to the 1st of November. Hopefully that's clear. Um, if you're on full furlough, you can't undertake work. Um, so that's important to note. So they can't obviously do their normal work, so obtain sales, do pipeline and things like that. Um, what is the minimum that we can claim? There is no minimum period. Um, however, the claim period must start and end in the same calendar month, and it must cover at least seven days. Um, the process for making the claim is the same, but now it's for a shorter claim window. So November claims will have to be made before the 14th of December, and each subsequent month should be made on or around the 14th of each month. Uh, what happens with annual leave? This was unclear when the first furlough came in. Fur annual leave can be taken during furlough. There was a worry that it would um, breach the, um, the furlough entitlement and, and create a restart, but that's the case. It's holidays entitlement, but you have to pay it at 100%. Things to consider, um, statutory pay, it's holiday pay, the 20 days plus eight bank holidays needs to be at 100%, but you could look at maybe changing what you pay under the terms of the contractual provisions, but that would have to be something that we agreed, which then touches upon what me and Helen are going to talk about shortly. Um, <clears throat> and then to jump on to the job retention bonus scheme, this was planned to be paid, I think it was around £1,000 that was due to be paid for people retaining staff up to the end of January. That has been withdrawn and won't be paid in February, okay, in 2021. Um, the government says it will be deployed at an appropriate time, so I'm at a loss as to what that actually entails, um, but uh, let's watch that space. And then the final point I'm going to touch upon, apologies, is very much a whistle-stop tool, but I've actually prepared a brief note on this, so I'm happy to send this out and circulate it, which details all of these points. But we want to really get into the, the nitty-gritty of it and, and try and go through a few scenarios. Um, but notice pay. This, the situation has changed on notice. So in November, you can claim for furloughed employees who are claiming statutory notice pay. Okay, it's important I will highlight statutory notice pay. On or after the 1st of December, you cannot claim for any days for which an employee is serving either contractual notice or statutory notice. So statutory notice is one week for each year if the company gives it, or one week if the employee is giving it. Anything above that is normally deemed as contractual because it's set out in the contract. Um, the situation in November is quite complicated um, if it's contractual notice. So that's what I'll say only for statutory notice um, is claimed. That's, that's what, Helen, do you want to, to lead on to the next slide? Yeah, thanks. Oh, got something there. <laughs> <laughs> um. Do you want me to change the slide? Sorry, thank you. That that's much easier. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so yeah, ultimately, what um, we've put together here, um, I thought it'd be interesting for us to have a look at 
the uh, kind of queries we're getting at ACAST. Now, as I said earlier, we, we do provide a lot of advice and we provide advice to, to anybody, to employers, employees, trade unions. But I think, um, and Adam, and Adam and I were speaking about this the other week, I think it's really, really important for us to acknowledge that furlough and, and the situation that, that everybody's in at the moment, particularly in hospitality, is not straightforward for employers. Um, there's, all, there's a lot of focus on the difficulty for employees and, and we, we completely empathise with that. But it's also really important to, to acknowledge that, that the furlough scheme, people have been asked to get to grips with a, a scheme that didn't exist 12 months ago on top of everything else that's going on. Um, and ultimately, it can also lead to, to employers feeling unable to plan. I mean, from a personal perspective, my brother and sister-in-law both work for a restaurant in uh, Manchester City Centre. And that restaurant has has already decided, as I'm sure others within within the industry are, that they're not even going to contemplate opening until the new year, regardless of what happens in a couple of weeks with the tier system. Because as an organisation, from an employer's perspective, they just feel unable to do so, unable to plan with, with, with Christmas coming up. So some I understand some employers are taking that, those steps at the moment because they feel that they have to. From employers, and, and particularly focusing on hospitality, um, the queries that we've got up on the, the slides at the moment, so whether we have to furlough staff, um, how can we select who comes back to work, or what if we want somebody to come back to work and they, they don't want to? These are kind of questions that we're getting quite often, um, either directly through, through me, through customers that I've spoken to previously, or people that, that I have ongoing relationships with, or indeed to, through our helpline, which is, an, is another advice service that, that we offer. Um, I mean, the helpline, again, they, they've had to get to grips with all this, this, this new information, this new guidance that's come out this year. Um, and they are extremely busy. I mean, ultimately, I saw some stats the other day that said our um, helpline's calls on redundancy had increased 160% in August this year to August last year. So they really are getting these, these kind of questions coming in um, on a, an hourly, a daily basis. OK, but I just thought if we were to explore these three different scenarios in a little bit more detail. Um, the first question that we've got up there, do I have to furlough my staff? The short answer to that is no, you don't. But there's a big caveat coming with this, because ultimately, if an employer chooses not to furlough their staff, they will have to do something. And on the next slide, Adam and I are going to explore some, some possible alternatives to furlough, because I think, again, it's important for us to acknowledge that, that furlough isn't um, a cost free thing for, for an organisation, for an employer. People are still accruing holidays, as Adam's just said. At some point, they're going to have to be able to take or be paid for those holidays, even if they take them during furlough. Uh, the employer is going to have to find that extra 20 percent from somewhere, that additional payment to, to make to people. And that that's not as easy as it might sound, particularly if businesses are closed, they're unable to be trading. So we do completely acknowledge that, that this isn't a cost-free um, scheme for employers. Sorry, Adam, I thought you were, you were going to say oh, yeah, I was, I yeah. was. I was going to say, I did. I missed out the point deliberately because I was trying to keep it to a minimum, but you can actually ask people to force people to take holiday. You've got to check on the terms of the contract. Um, but you can offer double the notice. So if it's a week, you can give two weeks notice to force holiday. A lot of people have got a situation, particularly in hospitality, where they have a lot of holiday to be taken and they were coming under pressure to be taking it in times when they were coming back and trying to get ready set. And something I think now we've got an opportunity, something to prepare for and, and stop it all coming through at once. So apologies for interrupting. <laughs> no, that's, that's, right. and that's, that's a really good point, actually, because um, ultimately, I suppose the, the options an employer's got, if we're looking at people who are accruing holiday while furloughed, the options an employer's going to have is to either wait and then people can take them when they actually return to work after a period of furlough. But is that what's beneficial for the employer? Because it might be busy. We might be needing those people in at that time. Or, as Adam's just said, we could actually um, give notice and insist that holidays are taken during a a period of furlough and in addition to that I suppose the benefit for the employer is you're, you're claiming the 80% you're paying the 20% whereas if somebody's taking it after a period of furlough it'll be up to you to pay that full holiday pay as per usual. Yeah so it might be a good thing around this time of year to top up people's salaries. Mm, absolutely but. yeah. Um, the, the, like I say, we, we will be looking at other alternatives on the next slide. We've got a number of things that, that we're going to be talking through with you, so alternatives to furlough. I think 
The overarching thing that Adam and I are going to keep coming back to, though, is the importance, the absolute importance of communication with, with, your, with your staff, with your employees, whether people are furloughed, whether they're not, whether they're on flexi furlough, so they're working some but not other times. Um, it's so, so important that you're keeping people up to date with what's happening, why it's happening. And I know, again, that might set, that that's easier said than done if, um, if it feels difficult to plan for the future because we don't know things might be changing on a fortnightly basis um, in accordance with government guidelines. But again, it's all about communication, explaining why something is happening as well as what is happening. Okay. The second question we've got on here, um, so who do I select to come back to work and who remains on furlough? Um, I suppose this is coming out um, from hospitality because some areas of hospitality, I suppose, may be operating on uh, reduced opening times or reduced numbers of staff needed if, if people are doing, I don't know, takeaway, a takeaway service, whereas they would usually be doing people come along to us. Um, if they're only able to open for certain periods of time. So it might be that actually we do need some people back, but we don't need everybody back. And how, how do I make that decision? And the answer to that really is it's up to you as the employer. It's completely up to you. Now, going back to what I was just saying when I was talking about communication, um, there's absolutely nothing stopping you saying who wants to come back asking for volunteers in the first instance. So long as it fits in with what you need people to do, so long as it fits in with the hours that you need somebody to be there, and so long as the, the skills that the people who put the hands in the air, so long as they've got the skills that you need in order to be able to effectively operate as far as you can at the moment, there's absolutely nothing to stop you doing that. I suppose if you, if you can't do that for whatever reason, or if you get too many or not enough volunteers, the decision is then gonna be yours. And I think, the things to keep at the back of your mind there are hopefully at the other side at the other end of this, hopefully you're wanting to retain the staff, retain the the, the employees or the, the workers that you've currently got. And ultimately by by keeping them engaged, by keeping them on side with you, um, you're much, much more likely to do that. So if you're in a situation where you've got too many or, or too few volunteers for coming back to, to work from furlough, um, you've always got the option of taking it in turns or, or using the flexi furlough scheme so some people could work in, in different ways. Okay. Um, the things to be aware of when we're looking at getting people back to work from furlough are just to have at the back of our mind that we're not discriminating against anybody in any way. Um, I'm not for one second suggesting that anybody that we're speaking to today would, would do so or, or, or would knowingly do so. But I have spoken to employers, admittedly this, this was um, early on in the year, but I did speak to employers who were making decisions based on age, for example. I'm going to ask all my younger workers to come back and my older workers to stay at home. Now that was coming from a good place. That was coming from concern for, for those particular members of staff. But could there potentially be a risk of an age discrimination complaint there? Possibly. So I think it's worth remembering that we might know what, what we think is good for the people that we employ, but just talk to them, see what they feel about it, see how they're feeling about a situation. OK. Um, and then our final point on this slide. So what if I want somebody to come back to work and they refuse? Um, and again, this is something that that's that's asked quite frequently. Um, I suppose the first thing that we'd be advising from an ACAS perspective is find out why. What are the concerns? Um, is it because they are concerned that there's not enough being done at work to, to provide them with a, a COVID secure workplace or as far as possible? Is it because they're concerned about how they're going to get into work? Do they come in on public transport, for example? Could we put um, some sort of adjustment in place to say, okay, well, we'll amend your start and finish time so you're not traveling during rush hour, um, maybe uh, less likely to be as busy, maybe less likely to come into to contact with people. I think ultimately the, the decision uh, lies with you. If you feel that you need somebody back into work and, and you are removing their, their furlough, then that's up to you. But if they are concerned, speak to them about it. And the reason I think this is so important is because, again, I have come across circumstances early on in the year where employers have basically said, well, it's up to me. I'm telling you, you need to come back to work. You're not on furlough anymore. Come back. 
And I think that the, the risk of damaging the employment relationship, even if the person does come back, even if they think, OK, well, yeah, I'd, I'd better do, the, the damage that's been done to the working relationship there is, is often irreparable. So it may well be that that person returns for now, but is looking for something else to, to go and work somewhere else. Because at the end of the day, um, all, all workers, all employees have, have gone through very similar sorts of things. Everybody's been concerned. Changes have happened for absolutely everybody. And everybody will have different concerns for different reasons. So it's all about speaking to, to people on an individual basis and not making any sort of assumptions as to whether somebody does or doesn't want to come back into the workplace. Um, and also, if they don't want to, not making assumptions about why that might be, actually speaking to them about it. Uh, Adam, can, can I just come in there? Because we've had one question from Stuart already. Um, Stuart Mitchell's asked, are the rules any different uh, are different in any way in Wales? Um, and I just thought, rather than leaving that to the end, let's put that um, through uh, what, what we're talking about now. Mm. I, I presume um, it's national law, but um, you, you please tell me. Yeah, it's England and Wales are the same parameters on employment law. There's some very minor differences in Scotland, um, which I won't bore you with. But uh, Scots are always like that, Adam. <laughs> I'm not going to make comment. I'll let you get into trouble. Um, the, uh, um, the tier system is different. Obviously, I understand you're about to go into lockdown shortly. I, I work partly in Chester, so we've got a lot of people living in North Wales. So um, I'm aware that you're about to hit the second lockdown. So the lockdown limits are different, but furlough applies across the UK. And the UK employment law, sorry, English and Wales employment law is consistent. So there shouldn't be any issues on that. But if you've got any specific questions, I'm happy to deal with that. Um, just drawing back on what I was saying, we, we dealt with, um, did a mental health event recently. Um, and one thing that came out is that a lot of people who were on furlough and didn't come back felt that they had been isolated and almost abandoned by the employee. And I think there was a nervousness about contacting people because of the risk of breaching the furlough provisions. I think it's important to know that if you can still do social events with them. You can still communicate with them. I think it's quite important. Two or three people have said on that on that, um, pro, on that seminar of, of how um, your very young individuals felt unable to return to work because of the fact they'd been locked down for such a long period of time. And so I just possibly keep that in the forefront of your mind as to why sometimes people are acting the way they are. It draws on what Helen was just saying. Um, should we move on to the next slide, Helen? I think. Yeah, I think so. I think just, just to echo what you were saying there, actually, Adam, um, I think with regards um, people being asked to return to the workplace following a period of furlough, um, don't forget, if somebody was returning after a period of long-term sick or maternity leave, we wouldn't be expecting people to just come back in and hit the ground running. Um, I appreciate that, that we might feel like we need that in these circumstances, particularly if everybody's been furloughed and now we're just allowed to open again tomorrow, for example. But <laughs> just really important to, to, to understand that people might be apprehensive, particularly if they've been off since, I don't know, March, and it's a lengthy period of time. So how are we going to address that? How are we going to manage it? And it's all going to be about communication. This is the stuff we've put in place um, to make things safe for you. This is what you can do if you've got any concerns. This is who you can speak to. Being really, really clear with people about what to expect when they do return. Yeah, and I think unfortunately hospitality has been left to react very, very quickly and give a short period of time. So I think it's constantly having that dialogue there because I think you, as a company perspective, you've been put in a really, really difficult position. Um, and, and so obviously that communication prior to it will hopefully help smooth it and, and prevent further things getting put on your plate because um, you don't want to be dealing with employee in relation issues when you've got all this other, or everything else to be dealing with. Um, so what we said we'd try and do is deal with other ways and alternatives to furlough. So um, what happens if you, for example, need to change people's hours? What happens if you need to reduce people's pay down? Um, what happens if you need to remove some form of contractual benefits, uh, contractual provisions such as um, a, very ben a very enhanced holiday pay provision that's not going to be costly, uh, cost effective for you going forward? Those, those sort of things. So in a lot of people's contracts of employment, there is a um, also, it's a sort of a flexibility clause, 
um, that tends to state something along the lines of um, we reserve the right to make amendments to your contract on reasonable notice um, and we'll give you no or, or in the alternative we'll give, give you no le uh, less than one month's notice that clause is in there as a means to which to change a administrative or minor part of the contract um, it's not normally there to make a massive change to pay. If you did do that, then there's a risk of a constructive and fair dismissal claim, breach of contract, and unlawful nurture of wages claims if you enforced it. Um, but what it is there to, to do is, it, it's normally there for things like um, yeah, payroll date changes and things like that. Um, but what it does allow you to do sometimes is actually have a conversation and say, look, we, we have this opportunity to make changes to it. And it, it, it facilitates a conversation. Um, but I wouldn't really just say this is coming in in a month's time, we're reducing your pay by £2 an hour, because that's ultimately likely to result in a claim. So that, that tends to come up quite a lot. Um, Helen, do you want to deal with the next one? Yeah, so um, as, as Adam just referenced, there might be um, things that you identify that you think, okay, we, we need to change, or, or, or it would be beneficial if we could change a term within a, a contract of employment. So, for example, um, it may well be that you've, you've got these uh, holidays that are over and above and they're costing the, the business money at the moment that, that, that you can't afford or you could do with saving. Um, it might be that you're looking at um, future proofing contracts in some way. So whether you're looking at including terms that weren't there previously, um, such as a, a layoff term, which we'll, we'll come on to speak about in a moment. Um, but ultimately, the, the key thing, whether you're looking at including something or removing something or changing any sort of term or condition within a contract, is that the only risk-free way of doing that is through agreement. So to speak to people, and I know we keep saying the same thing we keep saying about speaking to people, but ultimately um, speaking to somebody and explaining, OK, well, look, yeah, you, 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 your contract at the moment says you get however many holidays actually um we, we really need to as an organization look at addressing that would you be willing to agree to, to lose some of those holidays to take them down to statutory holidays now it would be a much more in-depth it would be a much more um free-flowing conversation than that but it's just an example and the most important thing is to explain why you're asking somebody to do this because ultimately to, to be really really clear about the reason behind something to maybe even th explain different alternatives that you've considered and, and have realized wouldn't work for whatever reason um but being clear as to why something is happening might make somebody more likely to agree um they might not be happy about it i'm not suggesting everyone's going to be over the moon about losing some holidays but they may be more likely to to agree to it because they understand how that is benefiting the, the business how that's benefiting the organization um, that's the risk-free way of making changes. The other benefit of doing that, the other benefit of looking at agreement would be whether somebody would agree to a change for a temporary period of time. So whether somebody would be, agree to something for six months, for example, put it in writing that it's going to last for six months and at the end of that we will look at it again. We might revisit it, we might make a, a further change. The other ways of potentially varying a contract. Um, you sometimes hear about one in the press sometimes um, when, it, when, when some of the larger organisations are, are making large scale changes. One way of changing some of these contracts if they don't agree to it is to impose a change on them and you can do that by actually dismissing them from their existing contract and then re-engaging them at the end with the new terms and conditions. But what I will say with that is there are risks attached to it. First of all, people still may not agree at the end of the, the notice period. Secondly, even if people do agree, technically you still dismiss them. And if they feel that that's unfair, there's the possibility further down the line and having followed through processes that they could consider making an unfair dismissal claim at an employment tribunal if they've got the, the required two years service that they would need to, to do so. And the other thing as well is even if somebody isn't going to consider taking legal action against you or that they're not going to um, go through with any sort of litigation, um, it's again coming back to this idea of the, the employment relationship. Um, you've imposed a change on them that they're not necessarily happy with. Um, are they going to stay? Are they going to continue working for you? Are they going to start looking for something else? If they are continuing to work for you, what's morale like? What's productivity going to be like? So it's a possibility. It can happen. 
but it's it's very very important for me to make the point here that it's it's certainly not risk free and it's certainly not going to be as beneficial for you moving forwards as if you're able to get somebody to to agree to a change um i suppose the the final way of varying a contract that, that i should really talk about is actually just just doing it so starting next week we are um all working half our usual hours or you're getting half your pay or, or whatever it may be um again i think the impact that that would have on something like morale or, or your productivity your relationship is going to be absolutely massive people are not going to be happy and again technically as an employer you've breached the contract of employment there um you you've you've not stuck to your side of the bargain you've promised somebody that you will pay them i don't know whatever an hour and you're now breaching that you're not doing it so there would also be the possibility of them saying, "Well, I can't live with that breach. I'm I'm going to leave, and I'm going to I'm going to try and make a claim against you." So, very very quick um, explanation of each of the different ways of varying a contract. All available on our website, and there'll be a link sent out to you um, next week. I think it'll be some time uh, with a link to all of that information that's on our website. But yeah, really really important if you're considering it, make sure if possible that it's done by agreement. Thanks, Helen. Helen, I've, uh, Stuart's a, a, a one-person um, question generator. He's, he's asking some really good questions, and we've got uh, one in the, the chat at the moment. Um, maybe Adam uh, or yourself, Helen, can come in on this. What happens if you discover someone on social media, a member of staff, is blatantly breaking social distancing guidelines? How would you manage that in the workplace? So you pick up some errant behavior that potentially impacts on, on work. Um, how would you deal with that one? Mm -hmm. Do you want me to take that one, Adam? Um, I suppose... It's a good question. Yeah, no, it is a really good question. And it's actually um, something that uh, we have been asked previously. Now, from an ACAS perspective, and I, I'm, I'm not sure whether Adam would agree, but please, please disagree with me if you don't agree with me, Adam. Um, I would say that people's behaviours outside of work, if they're going to impact on work in general, then an employer has the right to address those. And the the, re, the what I'm, I suppose I'm applying this to is if we were, forget about furlough, forget about corona, wishful thinking. If we were thinking about behaviour on social media in general um, and somebody making comments on social media that could potentially impact on their relationship with a colleague in work or they demonstrate actions on social media that could impact on their relationship with a colleague in work, then my advice there would be that absolutely an employer is able to address those because it's it's going to make a difference as to whether people feel comfortable coming into work and working with that particular individual if you've got any thoughts on that adam yeah i completely agree um also the angle is that you're obligated as an employer to provide a safe working environment for staff so by the fact that you believe they haven't been complying with social distancing um you don't know whether those individuals have been exposed to COVID, I suppose, which is the issue, but you also don't know that fact as well. So there is an issue whereby if you're aware of it and don't take action, are you putting your other members of staff at risk and or your customers, et cetera, coming onto site? So I think it certainly needs to be addressed. Um, I'm trying to work out in my head the severity of that action and how severe it sits on the scale. Um, I think it depends upon the actions because things that happen in your private life can impact on your work life if you were to make something like a political statement on social media that had a detrimental impact that's in the ether it's in the public domain so you're entitled to to discipline for doing so because it impacts on the business so i think you certainly can do um i'm still mulling over in my head as to, to where the severity sits in the circus i should probably say look and have a bit more detail but yes most certainly and i think the risk of for you guys if you're not seen to take action is um, this was a claim that was never really looked at, which is essentially failing to provide a safe working environment and um, exposing them to immediate and imminent danger. It's something that I'd only come across in once in my whole legal career prior to furlough, but it's, it's something we've seen a real spike in. I think I've seen three or four claims of that nature come across my desk. So um, it, you've just got to be wary of people looking at that and that coming back at you. So yes, please do. Thanks both. Um, Stuart, I hope that answered uh, the question, but um, do follow up with either Helen or Adam um, if you want more details. 
Sorry, Helen, I interrupted you. No, that, no, no, that's perfectly fine. Um, so, yeah, so we've touched on varying the contracts. And as I said, we, we've got links to all of this on our website being sent out. Um, zero hours contracts is something that we just wanted to touch on as well. Um, and the reason for that is because I think zero hours contracts um, can be quite, quite, quite common within hospitality. But I think it's really, really important for me, before I speak in any great detail about this, um, to clarify what, what I mean when I'm talking about a zero hours contract. Okay. And the reason for that is because we do quite often come across people we've got something written that says you are on a zero hours contract but when we delve a little bit deeper it turns out that actually they might not be so a zero hours contract um in, in its truest sense i suppose would be where there is absolutely no obligation on, on on either party so there is no obligation on an employer to offer work and there is no obligation on on the person to accept work if it is offered okay the potential difficulty is that what starts off as a true zero hour contract can become something else. It can it can evolve into something else. So somebody may have started working somewhere on a zero hours contract. And if it's a true zero hours contract, an employer may well be able to say, well, you're not going on to furlough, but actually we're not offering you any work at the moment because we don't have to. There's, there's no obligation on us to do that. But if somebody has started off on a zero hour contract and has then um worked solidly for however many months or years and they've done the same or very similar hours and shifts each week and there's an expectation that they are their shifts their hours um then there is a possibility that those shifts those hours have become their contracts it's an expectation um and in those circumstances it would be more difficult for an organization for an employer to say actually by the way i know you've done 20 hours a week on the same days for the past three years but actually no now you're on a zero hours contract we're going to withdraw that offer of work um it, it, it is quite difficult and to get i suppose an opinion on an individual situation for you to say okay well this is what what's happening in our employment has it become um a contract of employment it'd really be legal advice that we'd be saying at ACAS that you need. But I think it's really important just to be aware that the, the writing zero hours contract does not necessarily make it so. Have you got thoughts on that, Adam? No, I completely agree. But I, I suppose there is a possibility that if you're really struggling with, with your business at present and um, cash flow forecasting and risk of and um, being able to cover people's salaries i suppose it is a possibility you could temporarily move people onto zero hours contracts um to try and give yourself a bit of respite i think that that that's the, the point of that is that you may want to keep some staff on um but you may want to reduce people down to guaranteeing zero hours because of the fact that you want to try and keep them on your books you want to bring them on board you want to help them out but you, you don't want to be held liable for say 20 to 40 hours a week when you you can't guarantee those hours at present so again be really 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 careful with it but again it's all about communication and getting agreement and what we found a lot is particularly in the first wave everybody pulling together in the same direction and people were willing and understood why companies wanted to reduce people's hours down they wanted to take pay cuts they and there wasn't a lot of pushback normally if you're going down those sorts of routes you you've got to prepare months in advance um and um, do a lot of prep work, but people were just doing them in a day and getting 30, 40 people to sign up to them very, very quickly. So um, it, we're just giving you ideas to look at in that respect. Um, same sort of thing with layoff. I think that leads into that. So Helen, I think you're gonna deal with layoffs as well. Yeah, so just very briefly talking about layoffs. Um, ultimately, um, you, you may well be familiar with, with layoffs and what they are, but just in case you've not come across them previously, um, Layoffs a term that's quite often used uh, when people actually mean redundant, which is what Adam's going to come on to speak about in a moment. Um, but for, from an employment law perspective, a layoff is a very particular thing. And ultimately, it is when there's a, a downturn in work, um, usually temporary. At the moment, it's temporary, but we don't know how long it's temporary for. Um, we can ask somebody not to come into work and not to pay them. Now, they would be entitled to a, a, a statutory payment, a statutory guarantee payment, which I think off the top of my head is about £30 a day. But that's only for the first five possible days of a layoff. OK, so 
just to put that into perspective, to give an example, if I was to be laid off today, I could be laid off for an indefinite period of time. I would get five lots of £30 paid to me and then that would cease and, until maybe three months down the line. OK, so it can be a very, very useful tool for employers um, and a very, very useful thing to have included in your employment contracts. Now, if it is in your employment contract, you can use that. You can lay people off. OK, if it isn't in your contract, then you can still lay people off. But again, just reiterating that what, what we've been saying throughout, it's going to come down to agreement. So it's going to come down to communication. Uh, we're considering laying you off. And, and people might say, why would anybody agree to be laid off with no pay? And the answer is because sometimes the alternative is possibly redundancy. So being very open and honest about what you're what you're asking people to do, making it very clear as to if this isn't agreed to, this is a possibility. Not in a threat anyway. I'm not, not suggesting that for one moment, but just exploring all of the options with people. I think the, the other thing that you would need to be aware of from a um, while we're talking about layoffs is that if somebody is laid off and that layoff lasts for at least four weeks they can then turn around to you and ask to be made redundant so although i've said it can go on for an indefinite period of time um it can also be stopped by the employee after four weeks so just something else to be aware of that process is, is quite complex and is something anybody on on the acas helpline would be able to speak through with you if you did find yourself in that situation but it's just another thing to think about another tool if you if you're not already using it, if you weren't aware of it is it something that you can put across to your employees possibly that's really good. It, it was something we looked at when it was in the contracts when we were worried people might not agree to furlough and an 80% pay reduction is that the alternative may have been layoff because it was in the contract. So it may be something people look to bring into contracts. It's not normally in contracts. It, it's normally akin to a construction industry. Mm. Um, it's the, the difference in the pause between jobs. So, for example, you have a weak gap between two jobs that it's used to, as a means to stop co those costs being incurred. Um, but, but, and the, but there's an ethical stance to think of it as well, but there is, no one's going to thank you if there isn't a business at the end of the day, so the, there's a balance act. Um, that leads in that now into redundancy, and apologies, getting an employment lawyer to talk on redundancy is a bad idea, because I could be here all day. Um, but in, in essence, in essence... We're running out of time, Adam. <laughs> yeah, I know, so I'm going to try and keep it quite clear, quite simple. The definition of redundancy is there's three strands to it. Site closure, business closure, or the work of a particular kind that, um, has, has reduced. So, for example, we have, normally based on this time of year, we may have, uh, uh, I don't know, um, huge volumes and we need a 10 servers a day 10 servers a day the reality is due to the reduced footfall we only need five servers a day as such you reduce your staff because of the less demand that's ultimately what that's, that's, that's that stands for um there's a process to follow the acas code is advisory it's not binding but case law basically dictates that you really should follow it um you've got to have a, a strong business reason for doing so so the sales are down, the costs are up, um, those sort of things. And that's the rationale you put to it. No employment judge will ever critique your business rationale unless it is a sham, okay? So you, your business rationale is completely up to you, okay? But it must be, when you go into this, you must enter into consultation. So the idea in the first stage of that consultation is number one, that you go in, this is a proposal, and you look at ways to avoid it. So cost reductions, hours reductions, pay cuts, things like that. And then you go into the other start of the process, which is alternative positions. Um, and you also look at pooling. So have you got five staff who will do the same job? Then they all need to be pooled fairly and to choose who's the best person to do it for to, to, to go ultimately um, and you do that on a fair objective criteria again I'm very much skimming over the top of this um, ultimately you then got to have normally it's a minimum of three meetings at the final meeting you have a statutory right to be accompanied because it's a dismissal meeting however it's good practice to do it all the way through in my opinion um, and give them the right to attend with a trade union rep or colleague um, I'd always give at least 48 hours notice. The statutory is only 24 hours, but I'd always give 48 as a minimum. Um, there are some fantastic letters on the, redundant, the ACAS website 
and they cover every stage and that will help spell it out to you. The only other thing I'm going to touch on, which is a really simple topic of collective redundancies, um, is just make sure that you're aware of how many staff are going to be made redundant. Redundancy, the purposes of collective redundancies, is different. It essentially means if you're going to change somebody's contract. So if you reduce somebody from a management position to a junior position, that's a significant change to the contract that could fall within the definition of redundancy. So those individuals need to be included when you're looking at whether there's 20 or more people made redundant. If there is 20 or more made redundant, you've got a legal obligation to issue what's known as an HR1 form. A failure to do so is potentially is a criminal offence. It's a fine. Um, it was a bit of a toothless provision, but with a threat, but in recent years they've looked at it. Um, and if that's the case, then you must enter into a minimum period of consultation of either 30 days or 45 days. And the period by which the 20 redundancies is in a 60 day period, oh, sorry, 90 day period. So, <clears throat> and there is a potential claim for failing to follow that collective process as well. So what I'd say to you is, um, there's a lot more to cover on that, but uh, we wanna try and talk about a few other things. Um, just make sure you take advice on it and look into it. Okay, but have in the back of your head, how many people are we getting rid of? Is it 20 or more? If it is so, then I need to look at the collective redundancy points. There is, a redundancy process are pretty straight, can be pretty straightforward and quite hard to challenge if done correctly, but you need to properly think about your business rationale and why you're doing it. So what is the business rationale and where does where is the work I'm doing going? Okay, so if you get rid of a management post, who is going to do that work? Okay, because it must no longer, it, the work of a particular kind must no longer exist. If it still exists and you just give it a new job title, that is not a redundancy. Okay, so those are, uh, and there is a, there's a right to appeal as well, um, to against the decision. So it's just making sure you're aware of that. Uh, it was a bit of a jumbled answer, but <laughs> hopefully I've given you the red flags. Um, I'm just conscious I'll talk for two hours on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the other thing as well, Adam, actually, is I've arranged for um, a link to our redundancy pages to be sent out um, with, with, with the blog that goes out. I think it's next week. So um, there's a lot of information on our website. Um, it will take you through step by step. I suppose something else that I'd add really to it is um, Adam's talking about collective redundancies and numbers. And quite a lot of the time, people look for information online and they come across all this information about collective redundancies. And then they say, but I'm only looking at making one or two or three. The ideas that the principles are still the same. It's just the periods of time and, and the numbers yeah. of people that you need to speak to. So if you do come across something that says if it's 20 or more, just apply the same principles for fewer than 20 as well. The one thing I will I haven't touched upon is length of service. So obviously you have a in order to claim unfair dismissal, you have to be employed for two years. Okay. So and, and also you don't qualify for redundancy pay. There's a great calculator on the government website if you need to work out redundancy payments. Um then um, you don't qualify for redundancy pay or unfair dismissal. Okay. However, what you may want to be careful with is if, for example, you have a pool of 10 waiting waiters or waitresses um, and you need to get rid of five and three of those are short service then you've just got to be careful to check you've got a bit of a fair mechanism in there there can be consequences of just picking people out um, on grounds of age or all sorts of other things so you may want to apply a selection criteria to everybody to make sure it can't be then critiqued but it is a bit fact sensitive so anything to add any questions I, I don't know, Helen, we, we, we are, we've got another six minutes before we'll have to finish. Um, so I, I don't know how many more slides you have, if you, you're going to cover anything else. Yeah, um, there's a couple more slides, Ian, but really it's just covering what we've already spoken about. So there's just a don't forget, make sure you're speaking to people, <coughs> communicate with them um, as, as regularly as possible. And then the final slide we've got is really just to do with um, different different ways you can get help so it's got mine and Adam's email addresses right. on there and it's got the ACAS helpline number ACAS helpline is is fantastic and I'm not just saying that because I work for ACAS um they're open Monday to Friday 8 till 6 and if you've got any sort of query as I said earlier we, we, we are impartial so they won't say to you do this dismiss that person select that person for redundancy but what they will do is they will speak through all of your options with you and help you make that informed decision 
That's wonderful. Um, just to let everyone know that we will um, provide some write-up of this event um, that will link to many of the resources that um, Adam and, and Helen have spoken about. Um, also to say that uh, ACAS have provided us with a wonderful way of navigating their resources um, that link to the seven characteristics of good employment that we set out in the charter. Um, I do see we've got one more question from Stuart. Stuart, you've kept this question thing going. Thank you so much. Um, uh, what rights do staff have if they are asked to work during furlough? Who wants to take that one quickly? But, yeah, sorry, it's, I'm a bit confused as to what angle it's coming from. So obviously you're entitled to ask people to return to work and cease the furlough provision. That's, that's completely up to your discretion. But where, the way the question is asked, I'm wondering whether people are challenging whether they wish to whether they, they, they don't want to be furloughed. So if they don't want to be furloughed, they have to agree to it. So if they don't agree to the furlough, furlough then for, to be furloughed, then we'd have to look at one of the alternatives that Helen and I have just sort of covered. Um, obviously, if they refuse, refusing to turn refer from furlough, then obviously it depends on the circumstances as why they're doing that, whether it's on health and safety grounds. Have we got more detail? Uh, Stuart, Stuart's come back and said, um, i.e. on furlough and still working, i.e. fraud, HMRC. So, so still being asked to work for their own employer, not working elsewhere, still being asked to work for their yeah. own employer. Um, it's a bit outside my remit, that, Adam, I'm afraid. I don't know if you... Um, potentially, um, there is an anonymous reporting scheme. So HMRC has set up an anonymous scheme by which you can report your employer if they're committing fraud. Um, if they, again, it depends on their length of service and whether they've got employment rights. If you're not paid the furlough scheme, you've got a claim for unlawful deduction of wages. So you're entitled to that 80%. It's not to be used for any other things. Um, if your employer, for example, was to commit fraud, then there is a potential possibility where you could, I'd look to raise a grievance and state that this is, so it states what's happened and arguably have a situation whereby they've breached mutual trust and confidence of the contract because they're, because they're behaving in, in an illegal manner. Um, the risks with that is obviously you walk away from a job and at the moment that's something that's got to be taken very, very carefully. Um, so again, Obviously, you need to look at that and need to look at the circumstances. But um, so I'll be very careful advising somebody to leave a job. But yeah, there there are all sorts of rights attached to that, and that has actually had that arise previously. Thanks, um, Adam. and um, listen. Thanks to both of you. Um, normally, if we were in normal times, we'd be in a room full of people, and we'd all be going. Thank you very much um, and applauding. Um, unfortunately, that's not the case. We've got enough material here, undoubtedly, to fill two hours um, at least. Um, but contact details, um, of both Adam and Helen, will be available uh, to, to all of you. We do record our webinars. So um, if you want to go back and um, review what someone said, and uh, if you want to share it, perhaps, with um, other colleagues, um, then the, uh, the, the uh, webinar will be uh, videoed and uh, available uh, later. Um, next week, we have our latest um, uh, standard uh, webinar, and it's on age-friendly employment. So if you're interested in um, the employment of over 50s and how to get it right, um, that's the event for you uh, next Thursday at 2 p.m. And we have a, a very strong panel um, uh, including uh, the uh, Centre for Aging Well, uh, GMCA, um, and um, Electricity Northwest as an example of a, a good uh, aging employer or employer that's good at um, aging employment. Um, so I need to attend that one after you told me I was old at the outset. Yeah, well, there you go. Um, uh, I, I've, I've set it up just for me, really. Um, anyway, guys, look. Thanks very much indeed for your time. Um, I hope everyone's got something from that. Um, there will be resources on our website afterwards. Um, thanks very much and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye, guys.